to be here. <laughs> so good to be here again, it seems a long time. Uh, last time I was here, I remember I'd just come off that day on a 15-day fast. And I remember preaching, but inside my spirit was going bang, bang. And I thought I was going to explode. Well, actually, everything did explode because after that, it's been hell. So I've been working, th walking through hell for months. But you know that word that uh, Pastor Ray just mentioned? is very interesting, Psalm 1, because that's the word that I prayed over my family from the time that they were tiny little things, and I used to say that they would be trees planted by the water and that uh, would bring forth fruit in season. And the Lord reminded me of that word, that when you're going through a battle, when you're going through a storm, when you've had the promises of God and it looks like Everything the devil is doing is trying to uproot you and take you from your assignment and it's going to wreck your lives and come against your family and your children and your marriage. I'm saying stand on that word. Stand on that word because the word will not fail. And in the midst of the storm, you must hold on to the word of God. You can't be swept by all the winds of adversity. But you've got to stand. Having done all, says the Lord, stand. Amen? So whatever you're going through, that word is an encouragement. It's encouraged me. And do you know that um, it's not about a message or what a preacher preaches that really is important. It's what you carry that is important. That is the best message. That is, that is Christ in you the hope of glory. So we can stand up and preach a message, but it's not so much the message, it's what you carry of Christ in you. You are. You are the message. You are. And, and I'm so encouraged here. This is a great church. And I've seen you grow over the years. And how many churches have pastors that stand up and talk to you about the current situations that are taking place. I'll tell you what, not too many churches do that. And to encourage you to get into the word and stay in the word, there's nowhere else to be. You cannot stand on anything else. It is all sinking sand. But I do want to encourage you before I start with the word because last night, uh, no, it was the night before I was asleep and I heard this, and I thought there's somebody at the door. And I said, Holy Spirit, what is it? You're knocking because you want to get my attention. And then I had this vivid picture, and I could hear a kookaburra laughing. And I say to you, I believe that rain is going to come. I believe that laughter is going to come upon the church because you're going to see the manifest presence of God. You're going to walk into a supernatural realm in this year. It is a year of happenings. 2021 is going to be a year of happenings. And what, is, what you're considered natural is going to become the norm, the spiritual. And so you, you're carrying something of the presence and power of God. This is a time for the manifestation, not just of God's people, but the manifestation of God at this time and this season. So be encouraged. Amen. Remember the knocking and the kookaburra laughing. And I Googled it. And, uh, and one of the Google sites said that kookaburra, when he laughs, it means rain's coming. Well, I don't know about that, but I know it's a, a sound of victory. It's a laughter, and God wants to release your spirits into a place of joy. You know, not to be discouraged, but to take joy in the Lord. He is your delight. He is your strength. You know, and he's going to give you new songs. You know, something new is about to be birthed in you. So get rid of the old. Get rid of what the world is putting on you. And step out into the new, because there is an open heaven over your lives. Amen. And over this church, 
This church is, is really stepping into something. There's such a maturity. You've got a general. <laughs> That's what I'm going to preach about too. Generals. I gave a prophetic word. Um, I just put it up on Facebook. But, you know, we've got to stand with the generals that God is raising up. And uh, I believe that Ray is a general in the army of God. I'm not just saying that. I, I believe it. I see what he's doing, not just in your church, but in the state and having influence in the nation. So you do have a statesman. You do have a general leading you with apostolic gifting. So I just praise you, Ray, and, and I, I mean that. I mean that. So the question that I want to pose today is, what is the church and what is the future of the church? And uh, I think it's something that we need to answer because um, the future of the nation is about the future of the church. The future of the church is the future of the nation. And I want you to get hold of that because when you read the news, when you hear what's happening, bring it back to God. God has raised up the church for a specific purpose. And I want to just explore that with a, a little bit of teaching. So if you could come with me to the wonderful book of Ephesians. That's probably my most marked book. Certainly the first, well, it's only got a few chapters. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's very hard for me even to read some of the words because of Ephesians holds so much depth about uh, who we are. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's wonderful because the chapters, the first chapter is powerful. Because if you go through it, you see that we are blessed because of certain things. We are blessed. And there are some key things here. We're blessed because he chose us. Now, you might get really, really discouraged about sin in your life. You might get really, really discouraged that you've failed and you've done something wrong or, you know, you haven't sort of lived up to the mark and, and things might be breaking up around you at the moment. But I want you to know that he chose you before the foundation of the world. Now... What does that really mean? I'll tell you what, he chose you before sin. He chose you before sin entered. He chose you knowing that you would sin. Now, if you get a hold on that, that he chose you before sin, nothing would hold you back because you know that he knew the future. And in knowing the future, he knew you. And he knew what and how you would walk. And he knew the temptations that would come upon you. But he chose you before sin. That is powerful. He chose you before the foundation of the world. You were predestined to be adopted as sons. By Jesus Christ. Now we know the inheritance that God has in us. See, we talk about the inheritance that we have in Christ because we think it's all about us. But He has chosen us as sons for an inheritance that He has in you. And then it says that. We have received redemption and forgiveness. And if you go on, um, it's verse 11. I won't read the whole chapter, but read it in your time and please do a study on it because it is about Christ in you. There are seven times in this chapter where he talks about you being in Christ. In the first ver in verse four, it says, "He chose us in Him." In verse six, praise to the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. 
in him. Verse 7, in him, in him, we have redemption, the forgiveness. Verse 11, in him, we also obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him. God has a fixed purpose. And I know some, you know, when you get into scriptures like this, people can get a bit tired and, you know, you want the excitement, but you've got to have foundation. We've got to know the foundation of, of, of what the church is and who is the church and what is the future of the church because it's more, salvation is more than the individual. I mean, all the scriptures will tell us that. The Song of Solomon is very clear on that too, that you become first and you, th- you seek God, but in the end you become joined with, joined with Christ. So it's more, God has got a bigger picture than just the individual. And so often churches just focus on the individual, and that's good. We need to exhort one another. We need to build each other up. But we've got to have an, an understanding of what the church is. It is God's fixed purpose to use the church. God is, the church is God's instrument. It's his instrument of power. Nothing happens in this world. No change will take place unless it comes through the church. The church is the transforming agent of God. The church is the battle axe of God. It's the church that has the wisdom of God. It's the church that can dismantle principalities and powers. It's the church, we, corporate body, that's seated with him in heavenly places. This is Ephesians 1. This is Paul's revelation of the church. And it's powerful. And these days that we're in, we need to have an understanding beyond the individual, but us as a church and God's purpose for the church. And so he has this bigger plan. And we know that the church was birthed in the heart of God. The church is not a manufacturer of man. It's, it, it doesn't begin outside of some... Uh, um, denomination, you know, it, it's, it's birthed in the very heart of God. And it, it, there's a scripture um, I'll give you later, but when Jesus endured the cross, and I thought about it, it says he endured the cross knowing the joy that was set before him. The joy was to see the church being birthed. That each one of you would come to salvation because you are part of an eternal church. And so this is the mystery of God's will. The church is this mystery. It was birthed on the day of Pentecost in the upper room with that wonderful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it hasn't stopped. And God is increasing and, and, you know, God said to, to Peter, he said, I will build my church. And if you go into Ephesians chapter 4, it says that God gives us apostles and prophets and teachers and pastors for the edifying of the church until they come into the unity of the faith. It's the building. So Christ is, but God is building. He is a builder. And so he's not a destroyer. He is a Builder, Amen. And it says here in Ephesians that he, he's, he gave us, he, verse 20. No, let me go 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I wish I, I'm, I would so like to just meet Paul. I will one day, but wow, what a revelation. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being lightened, that you may know, this is the church, this is letting him know you're part of something bigger. 
What is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? He has an inheritance in the church. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us? Wow. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name. This is the church. We are seated with him. We are co-heirs with him. We are in Christ. We are seated far above every name that is named. Not only in this age, we're eternal, but in the age to come. Life doesn't end here. The church is an eternal church. He's lifted us with him above every other name, not only in this age, but in the age to come. We have no fear of death. And there'll be saints who will be translated that will even bypass death because we have the pattern of Enoch. That's a pattern. There's always a principle. There's always a pattern. We have Elijah who was taken up. He didn't see death. I mean, I mean, the church is going to go through some wonderful times. But we are eternal. The church is eternal. And he put all things under his feet. Well, if they're under Jesus' feet, we are the body. He is the head. So he's put all things under our feet. We need not fear. We need not be intimidated because we are co-heirs, joint heirs. We're seated with him. This is a revelation we need to really get. You know, sometimes we get a revelation and it takes a while. I, I remember when I, I've told you before, when I first went did into prison work and, and I went into the prisons and the first day spoke with seven guys and girls in, in for murder and... I remember talking to this guy and he's walk, walking on a machine, working on a machine. I've told you this, I know, but um, it's about revelation. And uh, I was talking to him about the things of God. And as I walked away, uh, I was told the horrendous crime that this man had committed. And at that point, I just felt that God's word uh, was too good for him. Can't explain it, but that's the, the horror I felt of the crime that he'd committed. And God spoke to me and he said, Catherine, he said, if I didn't die for you, I certainly didn't die. If I didn't die for him, <laughs> if I didn't die for him, I cer certainly didn't die for you, something along those lines. And what I knew at that point was what I knew in my head about forgiveness and about grace went clunk, clunk, clunk into my heart and I had a revelation of the grace of God and the forgiveness of God. So it takes a while to hear the word and then it takes a while for it to clunk, clunk, clunk down into our spirit. Now what about Peter? You know, um, and we, we read about uh, Peter in Matthew 17 and he's taken up onto a mountain and now remember, this, this, this um, experience that's about to take place takes place after chapter 16 in Matthew where Jesus says to Peter, Peter, who do they say that I am? And Peter says, well, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say, you know, whatever. And, and Jesus says, but, but Peter, who do you say I am? And, he, and Peter said, Revelation. He said, oh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Jesus said, that's good, Peter. Now, upon that revelation, I, here we go, I will build, I will build, there we go, he's a builder. I will build my church. Now, you think Peter would have it, don't you? 
He knew that this is the Christ. So then the next chapter, Jesus wants to show them something, to solidify something, to, to make sure there's an understanding of something. So he takes them onto a mountain. And Peter, James, and John go up onto the mountain with him, and Jesus is transformed. And, and you know, the glory, he's, the glory is manifested through him. There, this lightness comes over him, this glory. The, the glory that he had with the Father is sort of given a glimpse of here on the mountain. And, and Moses and Elijah are standing there. So, you know, this is a dimension of time we have to understand. We are spirit. We can operate. We don't have to operate in three dimensions. There's another dimension that Jesus was showing. You know, time, we had this linear idea of time, but here we have Moses who's died, Elijah who never died, that was taken up, and they're on the mountain representing the law and the prophets, and Peter's there who's had the revelation, but you are the Christ. Six days before he had a revelation, you are the Christ. And now he's on the mountaintop with James and John, and he says, oh, oh, it's, <laughs> it's good for you to be here, God, uh, Jesus. Uh, let me go and, and build a tabernacle. You, you know, you're all the same. I'll build one for Moses there, and, and we'll build a tabernacle for Elijah and, 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 and another one here for, for you, Jesus, you know, because he lost the revelation. He saw them. As just equal. So what am I saying? We can have a revelation where, wow, the light bulb goes off. But unless you get into the word, unless you ask the Holy Spirit to, to reveal, and that's why Paul writes and he says, I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. Because we live in such a limited understanding of who Christ is. I mean, how many people send Christmas cards of Jesus as a baby? I mean, really, please stop it. Please stop it. He's more than a baby. He's more than a baby. You know, people have an understanding of Jesus and, and they just see Jesus before the cross. They just see him healing, delivering. That's wonderful. That's wonderful, but it's more than that. He went to the cross. He defeated the power of sin and death and Satan. And he's now glorified and he lives and he sits at the right hand of God far above principality and power, and he's taken us in him before the foundation of the world, before sin came into your life, and he's taken you and he's seated you with him in heavenly places. Hallelujah. That's who you are. You're the church. And the church is the future of the nation. This is who you are. So what is the future of the church is my next question. But he's given this church this great position of stature and he's raised you, us, together with him. And we've been given this great power. And this 2021, we're going to see the maturity of the sons of God. No more. We can't keep going around the elementary teachings of Christ. You know, Hebrews talks about that. Because he, go on beyond baptism. Go on beyond all these things. Because well, who, Hebrews, who wrote Hebrews? Paul. Because Paul says, I think it was Paul. It may not have been Paul. Not sure. Thank you. But he says, but we move beyond because we have tasted we have tasted of the powers of the age to come. They've tasted of the powers. They've tasted of the, the power of the church. They've seen the future. Do you know we don't go to the future? The future comes to us. 
I've got you, haven't I? The future comes to us because we live by the prophetic word. And the prophetic word is the word of Jesus. And the future comes to us because he is the future. He's showing us the future. He is the beginning and he is the amen. And we see things in terms of man time. But Jesus shows us the future. The future comes to us. You know, when Daniel was prophesying and he got the, the scriptures of Jeremiah and, and all of that and, and, and prophesied that the 70 years of, of, of uh, uh, enslavement or whatever it was, captivity was going to come to an end, he saw the future because he saw the prophetic word. King Cyrus was prophesied 150 years before he even came. The future came because of the prophetic word. We bring forth the future according to God's word by the prophetic word. We command the future. Look, I know this sounds a bit, but this is scripture. Why do we have a prophetic word? And we have the prophetic word, Peter says, made sure because we have seen him. So Jesus brings the future. He is the future and we are in him. So the church, this is why we're seeing such a, 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 an uprising now of the body of Christ that are beginning to decree and declare and to prophesy because they understand the church's role for the future. The church can Bring in the future according to God's will and God's purpose and predetermined plan for mankind. And so when we're living in this age of disruption, it's easy for us to get discouraged. It's easy to feel dismayed. But I want you to know God's building this church and bring his purposes fixed. His predetermined plan is fixed. So, hallelujah. Yeah. So I've written down here the reality of the end of, end of age starts with Christ. Now, some of these things you'll have to think about a little bit, but Christ is our reference point. So that's why we've got this wonderful book of Revelation, you know, John, Apostle John was taken in. He didn't have to enter into the future to see the future. Jesus, the revelation of Jesus came to John in the book of Revelation in chapter 1. And he says that he's going to show him things that are, things that were, and things which are to come. And that's the whole revelation of Jesus Christ and his power. And his victory. And see, we are in Christ. John has the revelation of Jesus, but he is in Jesus. Somehow, we're so bound by our understanding of dimensions of time, but we're spirit. We're born of the spirit of God. We're spiritual beings. And we are part of an eternal church. One of the things that was shown on Mount Transfiguration was this eternal church. You know, Hebrews tells us that these saints of old are not going to be made perfect without us. There is a coming together of this church. The saints of old are part of the church. So the law and the prophets represent the saints of old. Peter, James, and John represent the age of dispensation, the church, the new, representing the kingdom coming. 
but they're one. And Ephesians tells us that in chapter 4, verse 10, that go before that. Let's look at 4, and let's look at chapter, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Next. And he gave himself some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. This is body talk. Till we come to a perfect man, God is interested in his church. He is the head. We are the body. And that's why we're seeing what's happening in the nations. We're seeing a gathering together. God is using it to bring his body across the nations of the earth to connect. There's such a connecting that's taking place across the body. But what struck me is the generals that have arisen in these times. And God, through the, through communication, we're being able to identify more these generals across the nations. And we have them here in our nation. And so the work of the apostolics and prophetic that's been going on for the last 10 years, people have been getting an understanding of it and what it is to be a son of, of an apostle, to, to walk and to be mentored by an apostle, to, to, to heed the words of what the prophets and apostles are saying. But he's taking these, these two into a different realm uh, of higher authority. These apostles are going to be lifted up like the generals in an army because I believe God is preparing his army and it is, a, it is the bride of Christ, but it is a warrior bride. And this is what God is doing right now across the nations. He's causing his warrior bride to come forth. I wrote in a prophetic word that this is not what we're going through, is not a transition, but it's a completely new era. The world might call it a reset, but for the church, it's a new era, a new era. We're going to see mighty things happening. Now, I happened to look yesterday, last night, and there were a couple of prophetic words, and one was from Dr. Jonathan David, and in 2.20, he said, God will release the five-fold ministries to a new level of order, of spiritual position, of stature. And 2021, he said, prophetic, it came in the same word, prophetic shifts in the church that will quicken the maturity of the saints and sons, and there will be many sons who will press into their inheritance. Because we know all creation is waiting for this manifestation of the sons, you know, the revealing of the sons. And so we hold back the revealing of Christ in us because of our pre-programmed minds that tell us who we are in accordance and aligned with what somebody said to you when you were growing up or in your business place or something. You know? And we limit God. We put these boundaries on our mind. We 
imprison the whole potential that we have in Christ. You know, and the devil is out to really knock you out and pull you down. My family's been going through such battles. And you know, when, Craig, when, when I was asked to preach, I thought, oh God, I thought, it's the last thing I'm ready to do, to preach. And I said to her, I said, gee, I've been going through a lot of, you know, I'm pretty emotionally exhausted. But, you know, something on the inside says, you've got to stand. When you're low, you've got to stand. You've got to get up. And, in fact, it was the week that, that Saturday, the day before Ray contacted me, I had made the decision I'm tired of trying to pass the families through the battles and be there for everything and I don't have the grace that they have to go through every issue they're facing every day that breaks your heart. Yeah, I don't have the grace. I was worn out. I was worn out. I had to lie on the couch and just, oh God, I don't want to think of anything. Don't, don't take, uh, no phone calls, no nothing. I've had it. Just take me now, Lord. <laughs> no, I kid you not. And then something in the spirit, it starts just a little tiny thing. And it says, come on, get up. So I got up. I've got a granddaughter at home in her bedroom, and I don't think she's ever heard anything like it. Hallelujah. Then I get a message. Would you preach on Sunday? <laughs> so, you know, the devil's out to, to really distract you, to get you down. But God's purpose is fixed. You're called for a greater purpose than you imagine. The day of individualism is over. It's about, in the church, it's about a corporate man, a corporate man arising. And this church, you can see the different gifts and graces. Somebody's starting a prayer meeting. Somebody's out there evangelizing. Everything's happening. You know, because you carry different graces, different ministry gifts. And so the church is arising. Hallelujah. I do have to finish. Can I have a few more minutes? So um, there is a, a prophetic timetable, and we're now in the prophetic timetable of the restoration. It's coming to a climax, the restoration of all things. And for this, the church needs to become that warrior bride. And I go to a couple of scriptures on this to, to wind up. Um, perhaps another time I'll, I'll speak on them because I've gone off a bit. But um, in Song of Songs, in chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, it says this, Who is she? Now, this is the church. The Shulamite woman in the Song of Songs is a picture of the bride, okay? Solomon, a picture of Jesus. Yes. So she's gone through her battles. We won't go into it. But now the, 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 the maidens are looking at her and they're all saying, who is she now? Who is this that's coming forth? Like the morning, like a new day. Who is this? Fair as the moon. This is the church. Clear as the sun. Awesome as an army with banners. And then they, then they say, return, O oh, return, O oh, Shulamite. Return that we may look upon you. And that's saying, repent, come on, come on, repent. Be fully restored. Be prepared. And the word I've got for this season that God gave me is be prepared. It's a time for preparation. Okay. And they, then, then she says, what would you see in me? Do you see in me the dance of two camps? Now, sorry, got to go a bit slow on this because it's, don't want to lose you. But the daughters of Jerusalem are looking at this bride 
as in the dance, the two dance, I looked up, those who forest, know uh, uh, Jewish um, culture, it's the Mahan Aim, which is the, it means two hosts or camps, and it's a, a dance. And they say, they're looking at the church as though it were a dance of two camps. Well, if you look up that expression, Mahan Im, you'll find it in, in Genesis 32 when Jacob went and he, he lay down and put his head on a rock, remember? And, and the heavens opened up and he saw the angels of God, they met with him and Jacob said, this is God's camp and he called it the place of Mahan Am. It's the place of two camps and I'm saying to you today that God is opening up a heavenly camp, heavenly angels are descending to help the church of God because the church is raising up the, the army here, but the heavenly army, it's the dance of two camps that we're coming into in this coming, to this year that we're now in. So I want you to be encouraged. If you want to do a personal study, have a look at Joel, uh, chapter 2, the prophet Joel. And I'll just wind it up, but uh, Joel, chapter 2, is, um, it starts with, Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm on my holy mountain. And he talks about uh, a people who come with great power. They come when there's a day of darkness. They come when all things seem gloomy. They come, but they come like morning clouds. There's something new coming. And they are a people who are great and strong like there has never been before. I want you to keep in mind the church of God. Nor will there ever be any after them. Even for many successive generations, a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift seeds they run with noise like chariots. Over mountains they leap like the noise of a flaming fire that devour the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. These are, this army is unstoppable. And it goes on. They climb, they run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. And though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They are city takers. They run to the wall. They climb into houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. And it says in verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army. For his camp, here we are, the two camps, his camp is very great. For strong is the one, the church, for strong is the one who execute his word. This army, just to give a praise, nothing stands in its way. It is the Lord's army. It is an army with overcoming faith. And we are in an era where we are given this faith to overcome. We are warriors.